the or emerythrax is one of the most controversial, well-known, yet paradoxically almost forgotten and under-discussed acts of domestic terrorism in American history. On September 18, 2001, one week after 9-11 someone mailed letters containing powdered anthrax to news agencies ABC News, CBS News, NBC News, The New York Post, and The National Enquirer. Three weeks later, a second wave of letters were sent, this time to Democratic Senators Patrick Leahy and Tom Daschle. Both of the waves came with letters proclaiming death to America, death to Israel, and Allah is great. This, so soon after 9-11, caused mass panic at the time and left the FBI scrambling to find a possible lead. Due to George Bush's incoming war on terror and the pre-existing letters apparently tying their culprit to a radical Muslim group. White House officials pressured the FBI to quickly settle the blame on al-Qaeda, despite minimal to no evidence or proof that there was any connection. They swiftly moved on from that theory and by mid-2002 their prime suspect was Stephen Hatfill, a biological weapons expert, who they investigated for six years to no avail. I won't go too in-depth over his investigation but the FBI wiretapped him and raided his house at a minimum of two times. All to end up giving up after half a decade of nothing. Exhausted and desperate after this long, protracted failure. By 2008 they had set their eyes on a new prime suspect Bruce Ivins. Ivins was a troubled man from a troubled home. He had abusive parents. And his mother who did not want him, reportedly threw herself down a flight of stairs while pregnant in a failed attempt at an abortion. Despite this, he graduated high school as a member of the Honors Society, and eventually earned a PhD in microbiology from the University of Cincinnati. However, he already at this time showcased disturbing behavior. He was obsessed with a woman who belonged to the sorority Kappa Kappa Gamma. And his obsession grew more so when she rejected his repeated advancements. He was known to sneak into the sorority and steal personal belongings to those who lived there. Such as diaries or ritual books. He soon revealed that he knew her address without her telling him and during an email correspondence repeated things about her son that she thought he had no way of knowing. Someone spray-painted her fence, Kappa Kappa Gamma, and later a letter she did not write appeared under her name in a local newspaper, defending the sorority. She never had any definite proof, but was sure it was Ivan's. However, despite this, after graduation he eventually became a biodefense engineer at USAMRIID. Due to an insufficient background check. If they knew about his history of depression and stalking allegations. He would never have been given such access to anthrax or other biologically dangerous materials. He eventually rose to become the senior biodefense engineer without much incident other than some off-color jokes at times and odd occasion of making co-workers uncomfortable with probing questions. He was regarded as unusual but nonetheless well-liked in the office. He also married by this time and had two children. He was an active Christian, a highly skilled juggler, frequently played piano and organ at his local church and was known to volunteer at the American Red Cross and the Salvation Army. He was also a songwriter, and sometimes composed little ditties to co-workers leaving for new jobs as a farewell gift. During the FBI's eventual failed investigation into Hatfield, Ivans actually proved a valuable assistant to the Bureau, helping them distinguish between hoax letters and helping him examine the traces of the powdered anthrax. While at his job, 
he had access to wet spores of anthrax. In 2002, there was an accident at Ivan's USA MRIID base. Fort Detrick in Maryland, where anthrax spores were accidentally unleashed from a secure areas into the base's unsecure areas, including where people worked. While no serious injuries were reported, it was a great embarrassment to the fort including Ivan's. When one of his co-workers reported worries that the spores may have reached her computer, he surreptitiously tested it, found anthrax traces, and decontaminated it himself, highly against protocol. He did not notify the co-worker or his boss. He was eventually caught for this and reprimanded. His excuse was, I had no desire to cry wolf. I would have been agitating people for no real reason. His failure to retest the desk after his cleanup was a flagrant violation of basic regulations. And he failed to recall why he did not retest the desk. Later, three strains of anthrax were found outside the room believed to be led out by a contaminated Ivans, including on his desk. Four years passed without much incident. No new letters and Ivans moved on with his life. The case against Hatfill was crumbling until it completely collapsed. Once Hatfill was exonerated, Ivans reportedly suffered a severe nervous breakdown, with several co-workers concerned with his behavior. His change in behavior was so drastic he lost access to many sensitive areas at his job. And Ivans began experiencing severe depression and even suicidal thoughts. These reports heightened FBI suspicions of him as a possible culprit. And was one of the key tenets to him falling under such severe suspicion. By 2006. The FBI had put all of their eggs in Ivan's basket and fully believed he was the culprit. They had many reasons to believe he was, at the very least, suspicious. For one, the woman that was a victim of his harassment in college, learning about the suspicion of him, came forward with stories of his concerning past behavior. Two, besides that, he had a history of depression and alcoholism. 3. The aforementioned flagrantly disregarding safety regulations. 4. Ivans was discovered to be working highly irregular hours. Before each of the anthrax mailings, Ivans was discovered to have worked unusually late. In secure labs. Alone. So late and so frequent that it was deemed notable in a business where late hours are not out of the ordinary. 5. Ivans was invested in Vex Gen. O. Biotechnology company who could have won the bid to develop a anthrax vaccine. And 6. Ivans for quite a while had been working on his own anthrax vaccine. Something he was highly proud of. However, he had learned it was likely to be removed off the market and replaced. Something that deeply displeased him. Many believe the attacks, if perpetrated by him, were to force people to use his vaccine to prove how effective it is. Like a twisted hero complex. Nancy Haywood, immediately suspicious of him and fearful that her harasser too would send her an anthrax mail began working as an FBI informant. During his emails to Haywood, Ivans complained about psychological screening at his job, newly implemented due to the anthrax attacks. One message caught her eye and horrified her. Him stating, the Red Cross is my sorority. It reminded her of his obsession with her own sorority. And she felt like he was almost rubbing it in her face. They discovered even more alarming facts by examining his computer. He was a frequent editor of the Kappa Kappa Gamma Wikipedia page. And his search history revealed frequent inquests into the dealings of the sorority. Four decades after he left college, he had emailed friends about his psychotic episodes. 
feeling like a passenger on a ride. Once. While on the clock at work. He said in an email, I'm a few feet away watching me. After the first anthrax mailing but before the second. In his group therapy program. He said, I am the only truly scary one in this group. He was much more secretive than he let on. With his brother. Whom he vacationed with every year. Having no idea he was a severe alcoholic. His obsession with sororities was also kept highly secret. With even his close family. And wife and kids. Not knowing about it. While interviewing co-workers. One of his peers added. He was in charge of producing large quantities of wet spores for research. So if anybody could. Have produced a lot of spores without arousing suspicion. It was him. Despite the suspicion. For the most part. Ivans appeared to cooperate. He answered questions from the bureau candidly and did not outwardly protest when they began to. Trail him. He even assisted them in helping them to develop cutting edge technology to differentiate between anthrax strains. However, his behavior at his job began to worsen. The FBI alleges he engaged in actions and made statements that indicated a consciousness of guilt. These actions include unprovoked offerings of various alternative theories to FBI interviewers. Theft of environmental samples from his workplace. Unauthorized and excessive decontamination of his area at work. Threatening of other scientists. And avarious comments made to various peers that bothered them. Or seemed to hint at an involvement or knowledge. By that point Haygood. And the Bureau. Were both convinced it was him. Starting from this. The FBI effectively completely ruined his life. They openly discussed their suspicion of him in the media. Agents reportedly implied that they knew he was the killer to his own wife and kids. He was severely demoted at his job. And was likely to be blacklisted from other opportunities. All of his computers. Weapons. And files were removed from his house. His alcoholism and depression grew severely worse. And he overdosed after injecting Valium with vodka. He never answered if it was a suicide or not. FBI agents watched his house at all hours and openly trailed him wherever he went. He grew incredibly stressed and paranoid. He lied to his wife. Saying he will willingly get rid of all of his guns while secretly attempting to purchase more. His wife alleges he became sarcastic, rude, nasty, things he had apparently never been before. He ignored the advice of his lawyers and continued to contact friends and co-workers who were believed to be informants he began mysterious late-night walks, aimlessly walking the neighborhood for up to hours at a time at pitch black night. Ivans also emailed himself stating, yes, 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 I finally know who mailed the anthrax letters in the fall of 2001. I've finally pieced it together, quote, which was never discovered until after his death, with the Bureau unable to find out what he was talking about or if he actually knew. He became addicted to caffeine as well as alcohol being inebriated at almost all hours of the day. He began to act ICN recently erratically at group therapy. Even leaving threatening messages on his therapist's answering machine. Soon after, he snapped. During a group therapy session, Ivan started randomly laughing out of nowhere. When asked why, he began ranting about being charged with murder and being hunted by the FBI. He stated he was going to kill himself and his co-workers, and that he owned more guns and other weapons than the FBI knew of. The therapist immediately notified the police, and he willingly admitted himself to a psych ward. While at the psych ward, he was interviewed by the FBI about the attacks. 
His answers were categorized as non-denial denials by the FBI and showcased his guilty conscience, which they used as proof in their case against him. Things he said included, I don't usually think of myself as a vicious person, if I found out I was involved in some way. I, I, I can tell you I don't have it in my heart to kill anybody. While in the psych ward, he suffered from memory losses often forgetting where he was and why he entered rooms when he left. He was apparently comatose. The driven and funny man was dead. And replaced with someone dry. Depressed. And mean. He would infrequently leave the bed. And spent most of the day drinking. Despite their lack of physical evidence. He was informed by his lawyers that the FBI was likely to secure a conviction for him and it was looking probable that he would get the death penalty. Eventually, he purchased two containers of Tylenol PM, and downed most of both of them with alcohol. Despite his wife's best efforts, the suicide attempt worked and he was dead. He died maintaining his complete innocence. Everything points to Ivan's. Right? Well. This is not one of the most controversial FBI decisions ever for no reason. All of this is circumstantial. Ivan's is suspicious. And he could have done it. D. The biggest gaping hole in the case was his location. One of the anthrax letters was sourced to a local P.O. box in Princeton, New Jersey. No evidence has ever been found to suggest Ivan stepped a foot outside of Maryland during the attacks. A link from him to the envelopes was never fully found. No traces of anthrax was ever found in Ivan's home. Ivan's co-workers believed Ivan's was not personally or professionally capable of something like that or doubting that he could have shut his famously large mouth enough to not accidentally admit it. Even within the FBI there was significant doubt. With FBI head Robert Mueller, under pressure to find the culprit after almost a decade, removing the chief of the investigation and demoting him to a smaller role, and replacing him with someone who agreed it was likely Ivan's T. Despite their lack of hard evidence, they moved forward with Ivan's as the prime suspect, raiding his home and ordering him to testify under oath. Only once in the two grueling days of investigation did he plead the fifth. A personal question about his obsession with sororates. He also passed a lie detector test. The investigation, even dating before Hatfield was very messy and is very negatively regarded today. Even by those within the government. Even those who agree it was likely Ivan's mostly think the investigation was very poorly handled. It was tinged with, at first, political bias. Then incorrect assumptions. Then desperation. Many of the core tenets of suspicion towards Ivan's have fallen under suspicion themselves. His group therapist was later discovered to have a rampant criminal history of battery, alcoholism, and DUI. She was a drug addict and former gang member who was under house arrest when Ivan's called. Ivan's phone call was released to members of the News Post newspaper, with the newspaper reporting that it was more akin to the desperate ramblings of a sad man than in actual credible threat. There is also significant doubt whether or not Ivan's even could have done it if he wanted to. Many of his co-workers agreed that producing spores as quality as the ones found in the envelope would have taken up to two years of hard work and high-quality equipment, and that Ivan's would have been noticed if he did that much secret unauthorized work. Lab technicians testify they didn't see Ivan's work on anything even similar to that. And certainly not for the amount of time it would have taken Ivan's. They went on to say that the containment measures in the base, as evidenced by the previous outbreak, 
were quite poor and the odds that Ivans could work with spores this dangerous for this long without exposure or being caught are astronomical to impossible. A respected USAMRIID biologist even said among the senior scientists, no one believes. Richard Spurzel, a United Nations microbiologist later issued a similar opinion, saying the anthrax used could not have come from Fort Detrick, which the FBI disagreed with. He later said, in my opinion, there are maybe four or five people in the whole country who might be able to make this stuff. And I'm one of them. And even with a good lab and staff to help run it. It might take me a year to come up with a product as good. The anthrax in the letters were many. Times smaller and finer than anything produced by US or Russian programs in addition to the anthrax. There was an anti-clumping device in the letter that was so complicated. An entire team of microbiologists could not perfectly replicate it despite 60 attempts. Even one of the targets, Senator Leahy, doubted it was him, or at least that he acted alone, stating, I do not believe in any way shape or manner that he is the only person involved in this attack on Congress and the American people. I do not believe that at all. Nonetheless, the lack of hard evidence and Ivan's death did not stop the FBI from officially declaring on August 8, 2008 that Bruce Ivan's was officially the only perpetrator of the anthrax attacks. The FBI believed he submitted false anthrax evidence to distract investigators and throw suspicion onto his co-workers, and that he reportedly used similar language in unreleased emails to the letters written by the culprit. The response to this report was immediate and incredibly controversial. Doubts were rampant both in the Bureau and out of it, with even several sitting senators and congressmen expressing doubts. The lack of any peer review by an outside non-FBI source was widely panned. Despite his highly concerning behavior, most of his co-workers at Fort Detrick believed it was a virtual impossibility for Ivans to be the sole suspect, or that he did it at all. This was shown when roughly 250 of his former and current co-workers attend end his memorial service. The memorial service of a supposed murderer and terrorist. In response to the controversy and supition, in 2009 the FBI commissioned the National Academy of Sciences to review their investigation. The NAS review ended in 2011 and concluded impossible to reach any definitive conclusion about the origins of the anthrax in the letters based solely on the available scientific evidence. Despite this, the FBI refused, and continues to refuse, to change anything about their stance on Ivan's. Curiously and the source of many conspiracy theories over the years it is believed Barack Obama had a hand in the swift closing of the case, and it was believed around Congress that President Obama would veto any budget that left any amount of money to a reopening of the investigation. Unfounded rumor or not, enough members of Congress believed this to the point where no one has ever made a serious effort to reopen the investigation. By the time this apparent blockade in President Obama was gone in 2016, Ivans had been dead for eight years and interest in the case had dwindled to almost nothing. Despite the controversy over the years and now decades, the FBI maintains their findings. And Ivan's sole guilt. To this day. And that's where the story lies. It's likely any chance of a definitive answer died with Ivan's. And with the FBI more than willing to shove one of their greatest. Most embarrassing train wrecks under the rug. And with no motivation to ever reopen it considering the primary suspect has been dead for a decade. It's likely there won't be that much effort to try and find one.
was this the work of a single, mentally ill madman, a secret group? It's almost a certain that we will never truly know. Source.